surgery and medicine and biomedical engineering. And uh, people mentioned here, he already gave a seminar, it was so good, we asked him for an encore. So this is the encore. This is the last one. And uh, I think those of you who have been here uh, really understood how much breadth and depth uh, John has in uh, cardiac electrophysiology and its application as a pioneer in mapping um, intracardiac and, and during surgery, um, interoperative mapping, the WPW story, and many other stories. So, John, now I introduce you. Okay. okay. You have to that over the formal. Oh. Yeah, this, is, this, in case you uh, don't recognize it, is the heart, not a foot. <laughs> <laughs> and here we have this very uh, simple uh, system uh, with uh, sinus node, an AV node, a ventricular conduction system. <coughs> we have these tracks that are called internodal tracks. They look like railroad tracks running through the desert. People used to think that's how the impulse got to the AV node, and that was the major way it got there. Would the electrophysiology for this simple? We wouldn't have to do all this work, right? We could just go home and do something else. It isn't quite that simple. Today we're going to talk about the uh, upper half of the heart, the atrium, and rate control, and the sinus node, and some other things about uh, that. These are the people that have worked on this project with us. Rich Chusel and I have been working on this now for, for too many years, more than we would like to, uh, to admit to. Uh, but we started this, uh, well, probably, what, 30 years ago or more. And uh, these are other people who've worked with us. Uh, uh, Bert Romberg for a while was a pediatric cardiologist. Obviously, uh, Jim Cox, you know, uh, Jeff Sappitz. Uh, these other people were fellows that were in the lab that worked with us on special projects that had to do with this particular field. Now, you can approach this problem that we're going to talk about today from many different perspectives. But because I'm a cardiologist and interested in the heart, I approach it from the standpoint of the electrocardiogram because that's where I first started asking questions about it. I get employed. And the questions that were related to why are there different P waves in the electrocardiogram? And what causes the P wave to change? Uh, Brody and Arsbacher became, and Reinbold became interested in this back in the uh, 70s because they wanted to quantitate the P wave, like people had wanted to quantitate the QRS complex. So they got a bunch of medical students and went about recording the P wave and digitizing it and putting it in computers to analyze it, and we're going to quantitate it. Well, they found out the P wave didn't stand still. They couldn't quantitate it. There wasn't any one P wave. Not only there wasn't one P wave in axis and duration and amplitude for individuals, but there wasn't one P wave for any one individual. And uh, Brody suggested that probably this represented a dynamic system, a system with changes in the atrial activation sequence. So we began to look at it in dogs, and we noticed in some of our dogs, they had these various looking P waves as well. And here you can see three of them. We call this one P1. We have three of those. We call this one P2. It's obviously different than P1. And P3 is different than the other two. And notice there is a relationship between cycle length and these two different P waves. Here at the short cycle length that we have this P wave, or P2, and at this long cycle length we have uh, P3. This is sort of an exaggerated sinus arrhythmia, but we can see this in sinus arrhythmias in some patients. Usually adolescents and young patients have exaggerated sinus arrhythmias. Dogs have more sinus arrhythmias than people do. So this correlation between the P wave morphology and the cycle length, the rate, became an interesting thing. Well, people began to look at the uh, atrial activation and the P wave at the turn of the century. And these are a series of people who began to look at it. Of course, and Thomas Lewis and Weibull looked at it, both Eisner and me, Cato, Goldberg, and then more recently, uh, Will Seeley. And uh, Walter Randall was the uh, person who did the most work on this, I think, uh, from Chicago in the 60s and 70s. And this is a picture of Sir Thomas Lewis, where he was trying to locate the area of earliest <laughs> negativity 
are the origin of the atrial wavefront and the canine. You see, I'm sorry. This is the superior vena cava. This is the right atrial appendages, all pectinate muscles. This is the inferior vena cava. This is the tricuspid valve here. And he located the origin of atrial activation focally at this location. Here is his sinus node location. A Frenchman named Weibaugh located it a little further inferiorly around the mid-right atrium, somewhere in here. But both of them found that it was a unifocal origin of the wavefront. There is a picture that I don't have. It shows the wavefront spreading centrifugally away from that point, the point of earliest activation, and a unifocal pattern of activation, like a rock tossed into a pond of, of water. So we wanted to study that too to see why the P wave changed. And so we made these two little electrodes. They have 250 electrodes, a few more. Uh, this one uh, fits the right atrium posterior laterally, the majority of the right atrium. This fits uh, transversely in the right atrium anteriorly. This is the anterior aspect of the SVC. This is the posterior aspect of the SVC. This is the right atrial appendage. The inferior vena cable will be down here. And this is what uh, the uh, maps uh, that are generated by the computer will look like. On the left is the posterior lateral view of the right atrium. Again, the SVC, the right atrial appendage. This is the annulus of the tricuspid valve, the IVC, the pulmonary veins here. And then this is an anterior perspective of the right atrium. Again, uh, the right atrial appendage and SVC and tricuspid valve, tricuspid annulus. And so you see we have this whole area covered with electrodes. Now, when we map the atrium, instead of seeing a very focal area of activation coming from one site, we were just uh, surprised to see this. Now, this is one heartbeat, but with every heartbeat or every P wave, this blinks on in just this way. So, if it were unifocal, I mean, that would be appropriate, or this would be appropriate, but not all three of them blinking on at one time. So here, instead of a unifocal origin of the atrial impulse, we have a multicentric origin of the atrial impulse, and the wavefront from these three areas collides, which means that you can get very rapid activation of a very large area up and down the sulcus terminalis. And you could if you just unifocally activated the atrium. Interestingly, here are three P waves in a rhythm. Well, two P waves, actually, but in three cycles. And here we see this P wave, which is enlarged here. We call it P1. And the activation begins here. This is the earliest site. And then we have a cycle length. That cycle length was about 500 milliseconds. It's a little bit longer cycle length, 536 milliseconds. The activation shifts from this site down to two sites lower. And then the next P wave with a very slightly longer cycle length, two milliseconds longer, has the same P wave, and the activation doesn't change. So this is in three cycles. And these are the things that account for these different morpholo morphologic P waves, and they are cycle length related to the to a degree. So we were interested to see what would happen if we manipulated rate with sympathetic, uh, parasympathetic uh, agonist or, or antagonist. And this is an experiment in which we infused epinephrine into the dog systemically. And these are a series of maps made at different rates. This is the, the uh, law of dose response curve of heart rate. In this case, it's cycle length. And the shorter cycle lengths are faster rates, of course. You see it has this sort of sigmoid shape. Here is where we begin here at this point. Uh, at a cycle length of about 650. Here's the anterior atrium again. We've shown that picture before. Here's the posterior atrium. And the activation begins here just above the IBC. 
and then we give a little bit, 10 to the minus 8, and we don't change the site of activation. The rate changes from 88 to 92. But now at 10 to the minus 7, uh, suddenly the activation shifts to two sites, one here near the sinus node and one here anterior and superior to the sinus node. And here we have multicentric origin at a rate of 158, with this becoming uh, these, these three sites activating simultaneously, but then at the highest rate and the uh, greatest concentration of uh, epinephrine, th this anterior site, anterior and superior, anterior to the sinus node and above it, uh, becomes the dominant face maker. Any questions about that so far? Yes. Would you see different P waves in all of those five Yes. Yes. The problem is the electrocardiogram, as we recorded, is set up to record the QRS complex and not much else. Okay? And so there are very subtle changes that we don't see in the P wave. In fact, there are very subtle changes in the QRS that we don't see. So to see those changes, if you really want to see them, you have to record the the electrocardiogram at about 100 to 200 meters, uh, millimeters per millisecond and blow up the gain. Here's another experiment using isoproterenol, much the same thing, it's a different animal, but again we start at a low heart rate, C represents control before any infusion, and as we increase the uh, concentration, uh, we move the site of origin from here to there to here here, and finally again, to this anterior superior site at the fastest rates. Yes? Do you ever see bifurcation where it's, it goes into a stable state of alternating between two sites? Yes. Okay, we'll show that in a little bit. So we wanted to know what the relationship of these various areas were to the sinus node. So we studied a, a, a couple of dogs in which we did serial sections, seven micron serial sections across the atrium above, through, and below the sinus node. Here we see a section where here, this is the SVC, this is the crista terminalis, which we have hatched in here, the crista, these are large thick muscle bands. There is no sinus node tissue here, but notice the, the ganglion. This is a very important ganglion. Here is the area through the sinus node. There were several of these, but this is just one. In color, you can see that this area right here stains lighter than the rest of the tissue. Here are the two sinus node artery bifurcations here, and this represents the size of the node. And then this is across the area, the inferior area, and here there's no obvious noble tissue on histochemical staining. And this is a very gross method of staining. We'll show you some other stuff later done here that improves a lot on this. So if the sinus node is this big in that dog, which is less than two centimeters, this is the area of impulse origin, four and a half centimeters. Also, we frequently find sites here. Now bear in mind that on these canine experiments, we're only looking at the right atrium. There's a lot going on in the left atrium that we're not even seeing here show you some of that later. So the sinus node really, at least the histologic sinus node, which is encapsulated uh, as we saw it, very small, is obviously not the only area that contains the pacemaker tissue. And these are just different functional rate ranges of different areas. We label OA the top area, OB the center area, OC. Just this is simply uh, this is not uh, very scientific. It's sort of we just sort of zoned out the atrium and looked at the different zones and their rate responses. So let's talk about human atrial activation a little bit. So we made some plaques to look at the the uh, human atrium. Now we're going to look at both atria not just the right atrium in the human. So this template or patch goes on the posterior lateral right atrium. SVC up here, right atrial appendage would be out here. We've cut off the tip of the appendage. IVC here, pulmonary veins would be back there on the left atrium, back here. 
This goes in the transverse uh, groove uh, in the anterior right atrium, the anterior SVC, just as in the canine. And this goes on the left atrium. The pulmonary veins fit in here. This goes along the left atrium, close to the left atrial appendage. This is the bottom of the left atrium, but this starts uh, on the, near the septum. And so now we can record potentials from the entire heart, and this is the way we'll display the maps for the human. The posterior atrium, we view it like this, to sort of spread it out. This is a three-dimensional structure. We've made it two-dimensional by putting an iron on it, just pressing it like we put it on an iron board so you can see all these different structures. So it's not anatomically perfect, but it gives, the, gives you the general impression of where things are. And if you fold this uh, piece of paper or this view here, then this will come down and be the anterior aspect of that same map. Are you with me on that? So now this is two P waves doing a, a sequence of uh, so-called sinus rhythm. You see A and B are quite different. This is the activation during the P wave illustrated in A. The dominant site is anteriorly. There's another site posteriorly, but it's a little bit later. Then with B, that site that was, the, the, the now the earliest site is where the later site was in A. This is the dominant site now. And of course this changes the, the, the atrial activation as you can see. When you have a site like this, the left atrium gets activated very rapidly anteriorly over Bachman's bundle. And you get an activation wave front coming around anteriorly and activating the lateral right atrium here by 90 milliseconds. But if you start it with a lower pacemaker, it takes longer for this activation wave front to get across the anterior superior atrium. And this one gets there in about the same time almost. And but the left atrial activation is now prolonged by about 20 milliseconds. So just changes in the pacemaker dynamically change the atrial activation sequence, will change the P wave not only in morphology but in amplitude and duration. So anytime you're looking at an electrocardiogram and you see these changes in P wave, this is what's going on. And this is another uh, uh, study in, in, in patients uh, showing, showing several different uh, P wave morphologies. Here we have a a obvious unifocal origin. This is what everyone expects the sinus node to be doing, and all patients should look like this. And as far as we knew up until now, uh, this is what we should have thought we would, we would see uh, any time there was sinus node uh, activation unifocally. Another example, however, this time it's anteriorly and posteriorly. In this situation, we have a very low site of impulse origin, probably at a very slow rate. And here in a patient, we have a multicentric origin and a very widespread uh, distribution of the wavefront with, with impulses uh, over a wide area. And this is the interesting one I think that uh, Dr. Stein was, uh, was asking for. This is a patient in which, uh, in this map, the site of origin of the impulses here at the rostral end of the atrium, uh, probably coming from the sinus node. Here in B, however, the activation, and this is doing a, a, a series, just a, 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 the same patient during this uh, period of recording, suddenly the dominant pacemaker comes from the left atrium. But it's not alone. The same site that activated here and dominated now activates 40 milliseconds late, and with it, this is a fusion B. So we have a site in the left atrium and a site in the right atrium with two wave fronts that meet in the mid uh, section, midline, and fuse or, or collide. In C, uh, we have just the opposite. This pacemaker now becomes a dominant pacemaker, but this, this site in the left atrium also activates, but it's now 40 milliseconds later than that, and we again have fusion. And now we have total dominance of the left atrial site. And this is characterized by negative P waves. When you see this in electrocardiograms uh, in patients who have negative P waves in lead 2, B5, and B6, they, that, so it's very frequent. I see these cardiograms 
quite frequently. How does that relate to rate? Because what I frequently see is uh, sort of sinus pygemony. I mean, it looks like sinus, but it's right. You can have it as an ectopic impulse, you know. You can have it as an ectopic tachycardia, but you can also have it as an ectopic rhythm, competing with the sinus node, as it does here. Right, and the PWS look identical in a normal PWS, on a normal ECG, but wouldn't yeah. on yours. Uh, in, a, in a normal ECG, you would see a very definite looking different P wave. No. You don't see it that way? No, I'll send you some of that. Okay. So you know. Yeah, I'll show you some that I have at the, at the end here. So I'm lucky for you, man. And in addition, now we're back to the canine again uh, to try to get a better handle on this. Uh, Rick and I and the, and the team also wanted to see what the effect of nerve stimulation would do to the atrial pacemaker complex. So we. Uh, dissected the, the uh, thoracic autonomic uh, uh, cardiac nerves and stimulated them, major trunks and also branches, both of the left and right sides. And we got various different types of, uh, of uh, maps and, and rates here. We uh, have a control, excuse me, uh, at a heart rate of 105, and this is the activation sequence. It's uh, multicentric, and here we do we do a right uh, vagosympathetic trunk stimulation. It changes the uh, site of the impulse origin to lower the site. This appears, and now the rate is 57. Here is stimulation of the right posterior ansa, which uh, increases the rate to 142. And now we have the uh, site of origin uh, superiorly uh, in uh, both anteriorly and posteriorly. This all may be the same site. And then we stimulate an, uh, an indeterminate uh, uh, right uh, uh, nominate. I think it's the right nominate uh, we stimulate here and get a heart rate of 101. Probably an unidentified nerve that we stimulated there, an unidentified uh, type of nerve. So what is this atrial pacemaker complex? Well, here is what it is. It's a widely distributed system. It extends beyond the classic sinus node. It consists of a system of multiple pacemakers which are functionally differentiated to provide a wide range of rate response. The data further suggests that there is a the functional differentiation is related to differences in beta adrenergic receptor distribution. We have done some studies with uh, Jeff Sapitz and Scott Bowe to show that there is a hierarchy of beta adrenergic uh, uh, differences at those sites that we talked about. Now the opposite side of this functional differentiation is an integrated control system. If you just flip that system around, then it controls, it keeps these other uh, pacemakers which are not near the sinus node from all going haywire. So it's, we have an integrated control system which is probably related to the same receptor uh, distribution <coughs> and density. The system is multi-level redundant, such that the classical sinus node can be excised and heart rate will still be driven by the atrium. Ablation or extension of the atri of atrial pacemaker areas results in loss of the smooth incremental decremental function and, res and results in irregular long and short cycle responses. It's almost as if you've taken a very smoothly functioning synchromesh uh, transmission, automatic transmission, and you've taken out gears two and three. Now the way the heart has to operate to control rate is by a series of long and short cycle sequences, and we see this all the time in patients with six sinus syndrome. Now, interesting that the group here have, have done some studies also on the sinus node and the atrial pacemaker. And what they did was to, to use uh, special stains of the sinus node, neurofilament stains, to stain the area of the sinus node. And those of you who were involved in this will, will uh, can speak to this more uh, later if you like. But here is the distribution of the sinus node in the rabbit heart, stained by this neurofilament, mid-neurofilament stain. And you can see it's quite extensive. Uh, 
Now this slide is backwards. Med MedPIC uh, reversed this slide. So you'll have to kind of reverse it in your head. I want to talk a little bit now about isolated uh, atrial prep and study of the, uh, of the atrial pacemaker complex. So this is the, this is the uh, right atrial appendage. You can also think of it as mirror image dextrocardia if you like. This is the SDC. <laughs> this is the right coronary artery. This is the sinus node artery and its branches. Between these two branches of the sinus node artery lie most of the pacemakers of the sinus node pacemaker complex. Now you can perfuse this artery in an isolated atrial prep and study it. So this is a prep which has been isolated. You can see it's been cut here and this is the ventricle, the tricuspid valve. This is the posterior atrium. This is the area of the crystal terminalis and pectinate muscles. And uh, I think this one is upside down. And this is the right atrial appendage. This should have been flipped up. I did my eyes, since I had my eye surgery, I didn't see, didn't see that too well when I was I think you made it a slide. But that's okay. We'll just hang in there, guys. And so this is uh, the same preparation, sort of diagram with the different uh, parts of its anatomy. Uh, we actually place the electrode patch uh, on the epicardial surface, here's the right atrial appendage orifice. So the IVC is here, the tricuspid valve annulus is there, the SVC is here. And these are all of the electrode uh, locations that we use uh, to record. In fact, these are the, uh, this is an activation map. The earliest uh, activation in this particular preparation is right here. And this is another activation map showing the electrograms showing the earliest electrogram located approximately here. We have a very wide area of, uh, of, of onset of activation, which means that it's, it's not just coming from one small unifocal site. And these are the electrograms of other areas that are activating later. And in that preparation, we can see that about 52% of the impulses are unifocal in this preparation. Uh, spreading uh, faster along the crystal terminalis because of the geometry of the fiber orientation. About 32% were from the inferior, from an inferior site, and about 16% were multicentric in these preparations. Realize that we've decentralized this, uh, this uh, system now. We've cut its edges and have removed at least that portion of the circulation that would have come from some other source than the right coronary artery. Like from the left coronary artery, there is some supply from that as well. So this is not an intact uh, system and we wouldn't expect the uh, information derived from this to be the same as in the, in, in the intact system. In that system, we were able to use floating microelectrodes, and Bert Bromberg did most of this work. He developed a technique for using a floating microelectrode to actually impale cells in the atrial pacemaker complex. And what we do is find the area of, of earliest activation. We had to uh, uh, support this atrium and, and use pressure to keep it from contracting in order to be able to, uh, to, to do this, but you could find very nice pacemaker potentials from these early sites. And notice we have a sinoatrial conduction time. This is the first area of the, of the rest of the atrium to actually activate of 100 milliseconds here from, from the onset of this uh, sort of uh, mid, uh, uh, midpoint in the action potential curve. It's a very long sinoatrial conduction time. And here, showing again, uh, potentials recorded from uh, several different areas of the atrium, A, B, and C, in between the two uh, rami of the uh, sinus node artery. Uh, this is recorded from the earliest area at A, and B recorded very close to the sinus node artery here, B still has a diastolic potential slope. Uh, 
but not nearly as, uh, as obvious a pacemaker as this one, and, it, and at a slower rate. And then here we have atrial myocardial uh, activation, a very characteristic uh, uh, waveform. Now, how, the, the hypothesis was then, and what we have is a uh, system which is receptor-based and differentiated, in which the greatest number or density <coughs> of bound adrenergic receptors determine both the site of origin and the rate. And uh, in this situation, we have the least uh, uh, intrinsic uh, sympathetic uh, stimulation, and so it becomes the dominant site because it has the highest density. Of, of active uh, of pacemakers. But the next concentration, this is the area now that becomes a dominant site because it has more and again a higher density uh, and a greater number of bound receptors. And finally, at the, at the uh, greatest concentrations, this is the dominant area. So this is sort of, was sort of the working hypothesis. As I said, we did work with uh, Jeff Sapitz and Scott Bowe to show that in fact, uh, that uh, it, we, we, could, we could demonstrate differences in the, in the receptor distribution of those sites. This is the ligament of Marshall in the left atrium. And the ligament of Marshall is sort of a redundant left sinus node. That in normal development, there are two areas of atrial pacemakers doing cardiac evolution and development left and right, where the, where the uh, common cardinal veins come into the posterior aspects of the atrium on both sides. The left side kind of involutes. However, all the pacemaker tissue in the left side doesn't involute. And impulse origin, as we showed in that one patient from, from the left side, frequently originates uh, from this region. Now, a group at the uh, University of Oklahoma began to study the ganglionic plexus, the plexi. They were interested in the mechanisms of atrial arrhythmias, and, and they still feel that the uh, neurogenic uh, control of the atrium has a lot to do with atrial fibrillation. Uh, and so they diagrammed the ganglionic plexuses using an acetyl uh, uh, cholinesterase type of, uh, of stain to demonstrate that. And they found uh, uh, the predominant plexi on the uh, right side here, uh, near the AV node and coronary sinus here, and on the left, in the left atrium, lateral left atrium, so lateral left atrium, lateral right atrium, the sinus node is here. And so they found these three uh, ganglionic plexi. The first ganglionic plexi was found back in the 1800s by this guy whose name is Remack. And he discovered the first ganglionic plexus uh, in the anterior right atrium where we found our early site of atrial activation in the anterior superior atrium. So if you think of the atrium in this way, here is the uh, sinus node. Here is the uh, ligament of Marshall. The gray areas are areas of predominant pacemaker locations. The sinus node in this region controls most of the rates, but there are ectopic rates that occur and can coincide and actually fuse uh, with these uh, more common and more dominant sites uh, along the uh, uh, sulcus terminalis in the right atrium. So we have a really widespread uh, distribution of those. And this is the location of the ganglionic plexi. Remax plexus is anterior. That's why it's been dotted in here. It's around the corner. And here are the other four ganglionic plexi diagram here. Now, this is what the P waves look like when they come from this side, 2 and V5. This is what the P wave looks like, and it's a very common P wave in 2 and lead 1, and frequently other leads with a negative and a positive notch component taking up the PR segment when it comes from the lateral right atrium. The P wave looks like this when it comes from near the coronary sinus inferiorly, 
like this when it comes from the middle of the AV node, and like this when it comes from the bottom of the AV node, somewhere close to the hiss bump. Now what connects and how do those ganglionic plexi uh, speak to one another? Well, other people have used histochemical stains, acetylcholinesterase, to look at more the nerve supply to the atrium in a lot more detail. And you can see both atrial ganglia and nerves. These are all stained nerves in different regions of the atria that are connecting these different, it has a ganglionic plexus here where our cerebral ganglia are collected and, and the nerves are, are integrating these areas. And so there is a brain of the heart. And so this control system probably is not only receptor-based, but it's also autonomically controlled as well. And just another view of uh, of these nerves as they're coursing through between these different ganglion plexi. So what is the function of the pacemaker complex? Well, obviously efficiency. You get a lot more rate elaborated than you could by one simple little pacemaker located in the middle of the sinus node, which couldn't do it all. And it takes a system which is widely distributed be able to do all the things that we need to do and do it smoothly and not jerkily with the different demands. Obviously redundancy, you need other systems in there, you need a lot of redundancy in case you have atrial infarction or you have uh, 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 nerve disruption or demyelinization in the, uh, in the tissue in the atrium, in the nerve tissue in the atrium. Adaptation and individual variation depend a lot on, on the uh, function of the pacemaker. And just again, some different electrocardiograms. This is a perfectly normal electrocardiogram. And the P waves here are positive in all three leads. Most positive here in two and three. Positive over the left chest. And this is an impulse which is originating somewhere close to the top of the sinus node or the top of the atrial pacemaker complex. Here is a lateral right atrial P wave. You see this very frequently. Negative, positive. In lead two, we can see it in lead ABL or lead one. Negative, positive. This is always coming from the lateral right atrium. Again, this is a lateral right atrial P wave with a very short PR interval. Negative, positive. This is a left atrial pacemaker. Negative in the left chest lead and negative inferiorly. So it's coming from the inferior left atrium. <coughs> this is a tachycardia from a left atrial pacemaker, an ectopic left atrial tachycardia. My point of showing this is that when the pacemaker complex gets out of sync, either because these areas become protected from, from uh, the control system. The control system breaks down locally and focally. These other pacemakers then may dominate and may become part of an ectopic system of tachycardia, which need to be ablated. This is a pacemaker probably near the coronary sinus, at the mouth or os of the coronary sinus. This would be a pacemaker in the middle of the AV node. You don't see the P wave for the most part because it's buried in there. Here you can see maybe a P wave out here somewhere. Another nodal pacemaker with a longer RP interval. It takes longer for the activation to get to the atrium and it's propagating retrogradely from top to bottom as the P wave is negative. And that's it. So I'm gonna stop there. And uh, any questions? Do you think any questions you might have? I think the point is that that uh, it was great when we thought of the sinus node as this little small area in the right atrium. It did all the work for us, elaborated all the rate for us, uh, but it simply couldn't do it. And it's like anything else. Life is a lot more complicated 
than we uh, than we thought when we first uh, began to think. This is a really dumb question. So now that we get to this, what exactly is the sinus node per se that is clearly distinct for? Right. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. Uh, obviously, it's it's for pacemakers, but it may also be a receptor. It may be a. Uh, a volume or pressure receptor, the arteries run right through it. Uh, it may respond by increasing rate to changes in pressure in the sinus node arteries that run through it. Uh, so the, the, there are studies to suggest that, that there are, that, that there are uh, uh, pressure receptors in, in association with the sinus node. John, do you, when you see EKGs like particularly those left atrial ones, do you re record that on the patient's uh, ECG, or is there a code for that? Or, I was wondering There's no you, code for it. Because it would be interesting it. to know what, well, how many, you know, what percentage of the population right. actually has yeah. this. And if you had, you know, you know, a big right. system like here where you got 100,000 ECGs, and that right. sort of stuff could be coded. Yeah, uh, that was one you, thing I would, what, what, what it had intended to do is to rewrite that whole ECG thing, but that's a big job, and, and uh, I just haven't, but they're not paying me that much. So, <laughs> I yeah, those done. are clearly, you know, there's no yeah. no ambiguity in those people ones. they're negative. You know, it's not, not a right. subtle, it's not a subtle change. How do you know with the one where you don't see P-waves at all that it's not a junctional rhythm, or do you just see a yeah. little p wave somewhere in that? Oh, it is a junctional rhythm. You That's can't see it, right. It's a junctional rhythm. Where in the junction, I don't know. The group from Oklahoma has been advocating ablation of the ganglia with an anti-atrial fibrillation strategy. What do you think about that? Well, I think, I, I think we'll have to wait and see what happens. Okay, I think it's, a, it's an experimental. Obviously, when they do it, if they do it well, they may end up, uh, if, if it is, if it does work in atrial fibrillation, we may end up with six sinus syndrome. <laughs> Uh, after that, because we uh, will we have ectopic atrial tachycardia is because we, the brain no longer has all of its interconnections in the heart. So uh, you can't do anything without changing something else. Yeah, there's another problem with that, uh, is, is the nerves grow back. And, and the bad news is that they actually don't grow back the same way they were. In canine studies, it happens within four weeks. And, but in uh, humans, in humans, it takes, it takes a little longer. My conversation with uh, Ben Sherwater and, and his son Jack, and you, know, it's, you have to really follow it over a long period of time to see the recurrences of what happens. They swear by it. Well, we all have our, you know, our long suit and our interest that we like to push and think that's the greatest thing since pound cake. You know, it's one, it's one of them. There is a basis for it. There's been some groups outside the United States that have actually tried to do atrial fibrillation ablation by solely ablating ganglia, and they've been wildly unsuccessful. Yeah. The other thing about this, and I didn't bring the electrocardiogram, is that patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, smokers, in other words, have these rhythms that are known as multifocal atrial tachycardia. <coughs> and what that really is, is the pacemaker complex going wild. Everybody's trying to get in the act. We have a symphony orchestra without the conductor, and it's like it's being warmed up before the, pro before mm -hmm. the program begins. And so everybody's playing a tune, but nobody's working together. And you see P waves from all over the place. That's one, isn't that a faster version of just wandering into a pacemaker, or is that a different answer? Well, wandering into a pacemaker basically is just you see exaggerated changes in the P wave with cycle length. Uh, which is sort of like a sinus arrhythmia. Some sinus arrhythmias you see P wave changes it has to do with, with how much the activation is being changed as the rate changes. Uh, but the, the multifocal people, uh, I mean, it's clearly a, an order of magnitude uh, difference there because the cycle lengths of the changes are a lot different and the morphologies of the P waves are a lot more distinct. Think about another possibility. I mean, there's ganglionic ablation. It could be also a ganglion stimulation strategy. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah, there's actually a small startup company 
that has developed a device, an uh, electrode for stimulating that posterior pad down by the uh, AV node with the idea being when a patient goes into atrial fibrillation, you stimulate that, which sounds somewhat paradoxical, what you want to do is slow down AV conduction. And, uh, and uh, they've right, actually... It's so complicated that you don't know. Well, they've actually done in human trials where they've done stimulation of it. They haven't permanently implanted any of these yet. But you, you actually do get a slower ventricular rate. You get a much lower rate response by doing that. All right, so you, you can't really, because of the complexity of the structure and the interaction between those. Yeah. And yeah. Then, like, so who, who knows what It's what hard to happen. predict what will happen once you stimulate one of them. They have, they have one picture in which it works, so I don't know how many times it would work. <laughs> <laughs> work on the one picture. The typical data show it working. If you could compute atrial ejection fraction, do you think where the pacemaker for that particular cycle is affects how much gets pushed out? Yeah, if you could. In fact, people are working on that. Isn't that some of the guys in the lab are working on that? Isn't the moon working on that? Yeah. Uh, he's working on that. So that's one thing that, you know, left bundle branch block changes ejection fraction. <coughs> right? And in other words, if you change QRS significantly, you will change ejection fraction. In the right. atri for the ventricle. In the ventricle. Right. Right. So the same, I would imagine, mm -hmm. it would be the same in the atrium. The interesting case would be when you have this left atrial face bigger, it's clear left atrial, and you've got the left atrium activating before the right atrium. Right. So you you're like really right be screwing up or how blood is being pushed into both the right yeah. and left uh, system. Yeah, so I mean, it would make a difference. I mean, whether it made any significant difference not, it would obviously make some sort of difference in the MT. Because it sounds like, from, based on what you said, that the higher it is, maybe the, the greater the... Well, the more synchronous it is, the, 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 more, the more synchronous it is, that is, the, the, the shorter the P wave, mm -hmm. the less time that it takes to get from the right atrium to the left atrium, the, the, the more, the, 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 the shorter the P wave uh, duration would be like a normal narrow QRS as opposed to a wide QRS have greater synchrony of contraction between the two atria. So that if you then do something that prolongs So, so the higher, the more synchronous? The higher, the more synchronous. And why is that? Is that just from this anatomy? From, from the figure that I showed you, well, uh, it, 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 sh it shows you, let me just go back and show you that figure, see which one is that. Well, I'm not. Uh, I mean, the numbers were shorter, but yeah. I mean, but why would that be? Oh, because it's it's closer to uh, uh, Bachmann's bundle, which is a very rapidly conducting the okay. two rapidly conducting areas in the atrium are the crista terminalis uh, on the on the posterior lateral right atrium, and then anteriorly uh, the crista goes around, becomes the anterior inner atrial band, it wraps, it comes up and wraps around the SVC, and then. It, at the septum, it becomes Bachmann's bundle, which is another thick uh, band of atrial muscle at the superior aspect of the atrium, which goes to the left atrium. And so you've got a very rapid conducting pathway because of the isotropy and, and thickness of the tissue there. The, the uh, velocity of propagation is faster in those thicker isotropic uh, regions. So does contraction become more synchronous with exercise? It should. Mm. Yeah, because if you do an exercise test, the patient starts out, let's say you have a patient who's an athlete, and he starts out at a rate of 55. He has a very broad, sort of look like a left atrial P wave. It may even be notched. The P wave duration may be 110 milliseconds. Then he exercises, the P vector actually moves from here vertically, and the P wave becomes taller in the inferior leaves. As the, and this is telling you that the site of impulse origin is moving from mid right atrium or low right atrium up to the to the uh, rostrum or, or summit of the right atrium. That's very cool because it implies that if someone doesn't do that, yeah. that's a marker that something's right. terribly wrong. Yeah. But it's also it should be associated with rate. I oh mean, understood, yeah. understood. Right. If someone in an exercise test fails yeah. to show that progression, right. yeah. that should tell you something that right. you probably didn't know you were looking yeah. at. Yeah, we have an experimental model of that the first version of the maze procedure 
probably destroyed all the incoming sympathetic nerves and the anterior site on, on the pacemaker complex, and uh, those patients had terrible exercise tolerance. That was why one of the first versions of the maze procedure was changed, is because we had no, no, no an adaptation to you know exercise. Yeah, we had two ideas for that. One was the maze. The other was the radium, where we wanted to take everything away from the pacemaker complex and not do anything. We just radiate incisions out from it, and uh, uh, and not cut across uh, uh, vessels either from the left or right side. Uh, and that would have been very difficult to achieve surgically in the time allotted to do the maze procedure. So uh, Cox wanted to do the, the maze. So we later developed the radial with this guy in Japan, uh, Takashi Nita. And he's doing uh, a version of that over there quite successfully. So I had several ideas. The maze was one, the radial was another, and I had another one. According to your gradient theory and the receptor density, then even if you had a denervated heart, if you I mean, yes. like if you had a transplanted heart, as long as you're uh, circulating at the Yeah, that's what the isolated, isolated right. tissue studies show. Right. right. If you increase, if you infuse the isolated prep with isoproterenol, the pacemaker will move up. Mm -hmm. Now we only identified two sites in that because we it's limited. You know, as we talked about, because of the incisions, the size, and circulation and stuff, but it would move in the preparation. Right. So, but is there a role for just more nerves going somewhere? Or, or, I mean, if you didn't have a transplanted heart and if everything was intact, yeah, I think the rules, the, 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 the agonist, the circulating agonist, would take care of of increasing the heart rate. The control system, though, requires the vagus, a vagal input, mm -hmm. and we didn't show any difference in the cholinergic receptor density like we did for the adrenergic. I thought we would find a, a gradient of those as well because when you stimulate vaguely, you actually make the rate go down just as you make it go up with sy sympathetic stimulation. But we didn't find in the studies with Saffitz and Bo. Isn't that right, Rick? Yeah, they were the, they were still seeing a shift the basement. Yes, right. And he says the respiration and the modulation right. shifts, right? Right, yeah. So we felt like that uh, that, you know, there was there was more going on there that we, we didn't understand. But um, what would happen is, it, 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 it's, this, it's this heart brain that you would have a problem with because now all these areas that connect, interconnect, and, and coordinate these ganglionic plexi mm -hmm. would no longer work. And so it, it, it's like the brain's projections and, and, and interconnections to all the different parts of the brain. I think the heart has a brain. And, and the ganglionic plexi are these sort of major areas and sort of look them as relay stations, but they may actually have other functions as well. Uh, but they need to be, they need to be coordinated. And uh, in an isolated prep, maybe you can't do that as well. I don't know. But so, so you're saying you probably can't roll out or roll for different differential in, input as well, nerve you can't rule I mean, it out. Sure. I mean, you've shown that yeah, the I mean, you concentration will. You can rule it in. Well, can rule right, it in. I mean, right, right, if you, right. you, know, you can show that you can stimulate these different nerves and change the rate of the pacemaker cycle. Uh, on, uh, as we, as we, uh, we didn't spend much time on that. We can spend another whole day on just study on the nerves. I'll let Rick do that. And what happens when you stimulate these different cardiac nerves? What, this is probably too big a question, but what's known about how this system interacts with the different neuropeptides? Nothing. Mm -hmm. well, data, first of all, there was some independent data also from Medley. I remember experiments from Medley showing similar things. I mean, you know, he was interested in vagal mm -hmm. control. So right. Mm -hmm. He stimulated the vagus in the nerve. We met with a lot of electrodes, and there was a four centimeter shift in the post rate detectors, so very consistent with this. And then there were some effects, I can't remember the details, there were some effects of the neuropeptides on this whole thing. And I can't remember the details of this thing. But there was something. Matt Levy moves to the exponent of accentuated antagonism, the idea that at different basal levels of sympathetic activity, you have different effects. And you haven't said that explicitly, but somehow that must be true, that if you 
hold a certain level of synthetic stimulation and different amounts of vagal stimulation. Yeah. You should be able to demonstrate We tried that. to look at that by simultaneously infusing uh, uh, <coughs> agonists and, ner and stimulating nerves at the same time. We saw some interesting but very complicated changes when we did that. We shifted pacemakers to the lateral right atrium and we had some really weird uh, responses. And so we didn't have any consistent right. effects. And of course, you have so many nerves there and there's so much individual variation in those uh, cardiac autonomic uh, thoracic nerves. Well, definitely the nerve that that why was there. Yeah. Any other any other questions? Thank you very much.